So we get a good historical context of the early church, all right? So look with me, if you will, here in Acts number uh, chapter 21. Now that we've laid the foundation, laid the background, let's dive in here to the first 16 verses here of Acts chapter 21. Uh, where Paul has left Ephesus and he's on his way uh, to, or left the elders of Ephesus and he's on his way uh, to Jerusalem. It says in verse 1, And when he had parted from them and set sail, we came by a straight course to Kos, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patera. And having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had come in the sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre. For there the ship was to unload its cargo, and having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days, and through the Spirit they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. When our days there were ended, we departed and went on our journey, and they all, with wives and children, accompanied us until we were outside the city. And kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship, and they returned home. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Tyre. To Lamus, and we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. And while we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, We and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, Let the will of the Lord be done. And after these days, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of Nason of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. And so I want to draw your attention again to verse number 14, if I could, at the very end where it says, let the will of the Lord be done. Today I want to preach to you a message I've simply entitled, The Voice That Matters. The Voice That Matters. So if you're taking notes, that is our title today. I'm going to pray And we will dive into uh, this passage today because there's so many neat things here that I think will be extremely applicable to our lives if we have a desire and a passion to truly follow Jesus and to walk with him. So God, thank you for this time that we have together. Thank you for your word that is open before us. I pray that now in these moments that we have with the Bible open that you will speak to our hearts. Lord, may the Holy Spirit, Father God, just invade, Lord, our hearts, our lives. May he just give us understanding from this passage of scripture. And may you speak to our hearts in just great and mighty ways. Lord, we look forward to what you're going to do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, one of the joys of having five kids is that there's really no shortness of daily commentary being shared in our household, right? There's not really a dull moment unless it's nap time or bedtime, and and there's always somebody talking, it seems like, or somebody vying for your attention as a parent. Uh, And and so the other day, I had uh, gone to Atlantic City. No, it wasn't to play the slot machines. It was for a pool convention, all right? I had to get some education to keep up a license. And and so I was there for this pool convention. It was a a few days. And so I returned home. And the minute you walk in the door, it's like everybody is vying for your attention, wanting to tell you about everything that happened in the previous three days that you were gone, right? As if I hadn't talked to their mother on the phone and heard everything that had kind of happened. But your kids are excited to share with you the most little details of the day. They're excited to share with you all the different things that are going on in their lives. And so as you walk in the door and you have all these voices that are crying out to you, sometimes it can be overwhelming because you're like, okay, who is it that I should listen to first? What is the most important voice in the room that I need to hear? And so you got to quiet some of them down and say, okay, one at a time, share with me what it is that you want to talk about. And so I don't know if you've ever experienced this, something like that, but I think as, as believers, as people who walk with Jesus, if we want to follow God and we want to understand his will, sometimes that's what it seems like in our spiritual lives, doesn't it? It seems like we have all these different voices that are in our heads, all these different voices that are vying for our attention, and it's almost like, okay, which voice should I be listening to? 
I think that's what we see here in chapter 21 in the life of Paul. As he's stopping at these various places, we see on multiple occasions that there's people who want to give him advice and who want to tell him what he should do, and yet sometimes it seems to contradict to what it is he feels the Spirit wants him to do. And so one of the things that Paul understood that we need to learn is which voice is most important in our lives for us to listen to. And so here we're going to see some tension arise between Paul and others regarding his pending trip to Jerusalem. And with this tension came the overwhelming need for Paul to clearly comprehend the voice of the Lord. And so today we're going to see in this passage some important principles regarding God's will so that we can not only discover it, but learn to live it out as well. I love what George Washington said about the will of God. He said this, the whole duty of man is summed up in obedience to God's will. George Washington, a man who had a lot going on, a man who did a lot of different things, said, uh, really, life can be boiled down to this. The whole duty of man is summed up in this, obedience to God's will. And so that's what we see here in chapter 21. We see a man named Paul who was just bent on doing God's will. He had other voices that were trying to speak into his life, kind of to deter him from what it was that God wanted to do. And so we see what did Paul do? What did Paul understand about God's will that helped him stay focused on what it was that God wanted him to do? And so hopefully if you're in here and you're a follower of Jesus, Hopefully, you are somebody who desperately wants to know God's will for your life as well. And so the first thing I want us to see in this passage is the desire for God's will that Paul had. Because for us, that is where it starts. You and I need to have a desire for God's will to be done in our lives. Now, many Christians are good at saying, hey, I want to do whatever the Lord wants me to do. But when you actually peel back the layers of their life, you see that their heart is actually far from what they verbalize with their mouths. They say, yeah, I want to do God's will, but at the end of the day, what they're chasing after is far away from what God would actually want for their lives. So the first step here in being a person who lives out God's will is you have to desire God's will for your life. I'm not sure if you've noticed by now, but in our study, Paul was a man that was passionate about doing the will of God. More than anything, he desired to be right in the center of God's will. For instance, look back one chapter that we talked about last week, Acts 20, 24. The Bible said this, and I think it's on the screen here, but it says, I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. He was passionate about living out the calling that God had placed on his life. He was passionate about making sure that he accomplished the will of God in his life. Later on, as he's writing his final letter that we have for us in Scripture, as he's kind of essentially uh, approaching the end of his life, he writes these words to to his young protege, Timothy. He says in chapter 4, verse number 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And so here, Timothy is, understands that in his life, his primary focus was to be the will of God. And so doing God's will was central in Paul's life, but it was also something he desperately desired for others. And we see that play out in some of his writings as well. A familiar passage in Romans chapter 12, as he's writing to the church in Rome, he says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable God, which is your spiritual worship. And then verse number two says this, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So Paul wanted them to be able to discern and understand what God's will was for their lives, that good and perfect will of God. In Colossians, he writes to the church in Colossae and he says this, and so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Verse 10, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So here, the church of Colossae, he wants them to have a knowledge of God's will for their lives and for their church. And again, 
I'm sure all of us who are followers of Jesus would say that we want God's will, but do we understand truly what it means when we ascribe to that way of living? You see, as we see in the life of Paul, God's will is not always going to be sunshine and roses, is it? And so many times we have this idea that when we come to Jesus and we follow him, that everything in life is going to be just this walk in the park and everything's going to be about prosperity and, and all these good things. But at the end of the day, as you look at the life of Paul and you study the principles of Scripture, you find that you can be suffering and still be right smack dab in the center of God's will. Did you know that? You can be going through difficult times and still be in the center of God's will. And we see that time and time again here in the life of Paul. Being in God's will does not mean an absence of problems. Rather, God's will is usually going to bring us into some uncomfortable and not so desirable situations. John Piper says this, Satan would always have us to keep the easy path. He would have us seek the safety and comfort over God's will. But you know what? So often God's will is not about comfort and safety. And again, we see that over and over in the life of Paul. Most of what we do in our life, unfortunately, is geared towards personal comfort and enjoyment, isn't it? Uh, most of the decisions we make are all about our own personal safety and comfort and security. But if you want to truly desire and live out God's will, you have to understand that it means you're going to face some uncomfortable situations. When it comes to pursuing God's will, we must know that this pursuit often leads us to the uncomfortable. In fact, early on, as Paul is being converted and he's been blind, the Lord specifically speaks to Paul through a man by the name of Ananias. And in Acts chapter 9, verse number 16, he tells Paul these words. He says, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of of my name. Very early on, Paul knew what he was signing up for. If he was going to follow God and be all that God intended him to be, he knew that that was going to be marked with a road of suffering and a road of pain and hardship and difficulty. And yet, if you were to ask Paul in any of those moments, he would always tell you it's worth it. I would not want to do anything else. Whether he was in prison whether he was being stoned outside the city, whether he was uh, being shipwrecked, or whatever the case may be, we see that Paul was focused on the will of God, and he had a strong desire to do God's will. There was nothing he wanted more in his life than God's will. And we may say we want God's will, but are you willing to go to those uncomfortable places? Are you truly allow yourself to get to the point where you say, God, I want your will more than anything, no matter what that looks like in my life. And again, we might say it, but deep down in our heart, do we truly mean it? Do we have that kind of desire, that kind of passion that we see here in the Apostle Paul? Because if you want to truly know God's will, understand it's going to lead you to places that are uncomfortable, places that are difficult, places that are sometimes challenging. So how do we develop this desire within us for God's will? Now, this is not an exhaustive list, but I think there's several things we can do if we really want to have this desire deep down in our heart. The first thing is we need to develop a longing for God. Develop a longing for God. As you wake up in the morning, just long for the presence of God in your life. I love what it says in Psalm 42, verse 1 and 2. It says, as a deer pants for flowing streams. So think about this deer that's been running all through the woods. It's thirsty. It's panting for streams of water. So pants my soul for you, O oh God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Don't you love that? Here the psalmist is writing, my heart longs for God. Like a deer panting after water, that is how much I long for God. Psalm 143, verse number six. I stretch out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a parched land. So again, we see the picture of this uh, person longing for the presence of God. 1 Peter 2, verse number two says, Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow into salvation. 
So here he says, like an infant who just longs for that milk, right? If you've had a baby and got the opportunity to raise a child, you know that when that baby's hungry, there's not anything else on its mind but getting something to eat. And so it says here that that is what our passion for God should be. Like that baby longing for that milk should be our desire and our longing for God. So how do we develop a desire for God's will like Paul had? Well, I think it starts by developing a longing for God in our own hearts and our own lives. But another way we can develop this desire within us is to rehearse the goodness of God. Notice what it says in verse 3. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Has the Lord been good? Right? I think all of us can agree the Lord has been extremely good, more good than we truly deserve. But so often we get busy with life and we forget about the goodness and the mercies of God that the Bible says are new every morning. So if I want to develop a desire for God, one of the things I need to do is start rehearsing the goodness of God. Every day as I go throughout my day, I just need to meditate and think about and rehearse about how good God truly has been. So I can develop a longing for God. I can rehearse the goodness of God. Another thing I can do, and we see Paul doing it here in this passage, is we can embrace community. Being around fellow brothers and sisters in Christ is a great way for us to really have an uh, increased desire to, to follow after God. If we want to know God's will and we want to desire after God, one of the best things we can do is surround ourselves with people who are also committed to the same thing. That's why Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 says this, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. That's why I so appreciate every one of you who make it a point to come out here on Sunday morning because, yes, you can get great teaching online, and we love to provide that for people, especially in this season with COVID, but there's just nothing that can replace the fellowship we get in being together. And that's why here God, through the Apostle Paul, says don't neglect gathering together. Because if we want to develop a desire for God and we want to long and hunger after him, one of the best things we can do is surround ourselves with people and have people in our lives who are chasing after God in the same way. Notice what happens here in Acts chapter 21. It says in verse 1, And when we parted from them and set sail, we came by a straight course to Kos, the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patera. Having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When he had come in the sight of Cyprus, leaving on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed in, at Tyre, for there a ship was un, to unload its cargo. So Paul just found a ship that was headed for Phoenicia, happened to be a cargo ship. This isn't a cruise ship that Paul's sailing on, so understand kind of the, the, the surroundings in which he is. He's on this boat that's probably not super comfortable, but he travels to all these different stops as they pick up and unload cargo, and then they get to Tyre. In verse number four, it says, And having sought out the disciples... Now, it's easy to read over that, but again, all throughout these last few chapters, we have seen Paul's heart and just longing to be with the people of God. Notice how much he longed for community in this passage. We just read that in verse 4. Look at what it says in verse 7. When he had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemais, and we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. Then in verse 8, the next day we departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist. And so we see here time and time again, although Paul could just say it's easy, hey, I deserve a vacation, I deserve a break, let me just take it easy until I get to Jerusalem, let me just have some alone time. When Paul would land and at, at these different cities, what was it that he did? He went and he looked for other fellow believers, other brothers and sisters that he could encourage and be encouraged by. It says there in verse 4, he sought after them. He sought after them. And so that word sought after speaks to the fact that he was looking diligently for fellow believers that he could fellowship with. If we want to develop a desire for God's will and a hunger for God and what God wants for our lives, one of the best things we can do is allow ourselves to regularly be surrounded by the people of God who can encourage us, 
and spur us on. I love hearing how God is working in your lives. I love hearing how God is working in, in the lives of other believers, maybe not in this church. It just encourages my heart and encourages my, my soul because I know the same God that's doing that in their life is, has done it in my life, and it just spurs me on. And so that's why fellowship is so important. Again, I know some of us, uh, you know, get uncomfortable, you know, talking to new people. And there might be some people in this room you've never talked to before. It's maybe as, as small as this room is. I'd encourage you, get to know people. Step out of your comfort zone. Go meet people because you have no idea how encouraged you may be simply by getting to hear somebody else's story. And so we see here in this passage that wherever Paul lands... He is seeking after, he is looking for believers that are gathering together because he wants to knit his heart together with them and encourage them and be encouraged at the same time. And so I love that about Paul. He was willing to embrace community. Another thing we can do if we want to develop this desire for God's will is we can simply ask for it, right? Look at what it says in Matthew 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? You want to develop a desire for God's will? You want to develop just this deep relationship with God, this hunger for God? One of the best and easiest things you can do is simply ask. As you take time in prayer, say, God, I want to know you. God, I want to hunger after you. God, help me to seek you first above everything else. Ask for it. And so we see here the first step in living this life that is constantly following the will of God is that we have to have a desire for God's will. Understanding that it means stepping out of our comfort zone, that it means maybe going to some awkward, uncomfortable places. Understanding that it means God might tell us to do something we, we aren't necessarily real thrilled about doing in the moment, but yet our passion, our love for God allows us to step out of, in faith and do whatever it is because we long to know and do God's will. So desire God's will. That's the first step. And I'm sure if I asked any one of you in this room, hey, do you want to do God's will? All of you would say yes. But let's peel back the layers a little bit. Let's look deep down in our heart. And if God asks you to do something that seems uncomfortable, are you truly willing to do it? Are you truly willing to step out in faith? Are you truly willing to live a life that says, God, even that as hard as that would be, I'm willing to do it because I desire your will more than anything else. And so again, I don't know what it is in your life. God speaks to all of us in different ways and leads us all in different directions. But I do know this. God's will often leads us to uncomfortable places. And so we need to desire his will before we can ever understand and get to know more intimately what God's will is. So we see Paul, he's traveling here. He is going to all these different locations on a boat. And as he lands in these cities, he's seeking out believers he can fellowship with. And as he is fellowshipping with them, we see that there is a kind of this tension that arises. As he talks about going to Jerusalem, some of them are kind of having this, this, uh, these, these words from the Spirit. And they're kind of giving him contradictory advice. It says in verse 4, and having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days, and through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. So this is interesting. We've already talked about that Paul was constrained to go to Jerusalem by the Spirit. He felt in his heart that the Spirit of God wanted him to go there. And now he meets these believers who are saying, in the spirit, not to go. Who was wrong? Were either of them wrong? You see, what is happening here is they are actually confirming what God has already told Paul. They're interpreting what the spirit is telling them in a wrong way. Yes, he's going to experience hardships. Hardships. 
Yes, he's going to experience difficulties. Yes, it's going to be hard for him to go. And so they look at that and say, no, Paul, you probably ought not go there. But Paul says, no, God's already told me it's going to be difficulty. And I appreciate and respect what you're saying, but my heart is set. My focus is set on Jerusalem. And I know it's going to be hard. I know it's going to be difficult. In fact, he said in the last chapter, I know that imprisonment and, and trials and all these difficulties await me. So really, when they're saying this to Paul, they're just misinterpreting the application of what the Spirit is telling them. The Spirit wasn't giving them wrong advice. They were just misinterpreted. Does that make sense? And so what we need to understand, I think, from this passage, and this is where we're going to spend pretty much the rest of our time, is how do we decipher God's will in our lives? Right? Because God has an individual will for every single one of us. He has a purpose and plans for every single one of us sitting in this room. And what God wants you to do is different than what God wants me to do on a personal level. Now, there are some things that are the same, but there's some things that are different because he's gifted you different than he's gifted me. And so how do we decipher, and that's the second point here, how do we decipher God's will? How do we determine what it is that God wants for my life? And I think here in this passage, we see several ways that God can use to confirm his will to us. And the first one I've already hinted at, and that is people. Right? Oftentimes, God does use other people to encourage us down the path of God's will. And again, even though from the surface, this might look like it's contradicting what the Spirit of God is saying, in reality, what it's doing is God is using people to confirm his will to Paul. They're saying, hey, trials and tribulations await you. He gets... Uh, he, he travels on, he meets his prophet Agabus, right? We can read about that later on in the passage. Agabus came down from Judea, and coming to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own feet and hands, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, this is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt. So again, we see Agabus kind of giving the same advice as, as these other people, saying, hey, the Spirit of God is telling me that you are going to face hardships and difficulties. But what they're actually doing is God is using people to confirm to Paul what he has already revealed to him. So people have a huge part to play sometimes in us understanding and deciphering God's will. God uses other people sometimes to help us figure out what God's will is for our lives. Now, I know I've had many situations in my life. I was kind of seeking after God's will, praying through God, what would you want? And I've had people who came beside me and encouraged me as I shared my heart with them or spoke a, a word of truth to me that kind of allowed the light bulb to go off. And God sometimes will use other people to help us understand and decipher what his will is. We move on to verse 5. We see, I think, another element of how we can decipher God's will. And that is, it says, When our days there were ended, we departed and went on our journey. And they all, with wives and children, accompanied us until we were outside the city. And kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship, and they returned home. And I love how it says here, the women and the children came along, right? This is a family affair coming and going with Paul. And, and I love seeing when families are, are, are coming to church together. That's essentially what's going on here. They are gathered together. They are escorting Paul back to the ship, soaking in every last moment with Paul. But it says they kneeled down and they prayed together. Do you know one of the best ways that you can seek out and decipher God's will for your life is to simply pray and ask God, God, what is your will for my life in this particular situation? God, what is it that you desire for my life? And again, God, being a good father, will oftentimes help us see that next step that we should take. Psalm 134, or 143.10, the Bible says this, Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. That's a good thing for us to pray daily, isn't it? Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level level ground. So in another way we can decipher God's will is not just through people that God places in our lives, but also through prayer. Another thing we see here is God often speaks through prophecy. 
Now here we see this happen a couple times. It says in, he enters the house of one named Philip. He had four sons, four, or sorry, four unmarried daughters who prophesied. Then he gets, it says why they were staying for many days there. A prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And I read just a minute ago what his message was. So here God is using prophecy. Now it's interesting. Let's not skip over this man, Philip. We were introduced to him way early in our study, right? He was one of the original seven, seven deacons, right? He was one of those that were uh, picked out and chosen to help serve, uh, you know, the people in the early church there because some of the widows were being neglected. And so just think about this for a second. I don't know what interaction maybe uh, Philip had with Paul up to this point, but just think about what has transpired over the many years that Paul has been traveling. If they haven't met up until this point, the last time Philip would have seen Paul was when Paul was holding the coats of those who were stoning Philip's good friend Stephen. Right? Because they were both deacons together in the early church. Paul was standing there holding the coat of those men that were stoning Stephen one of Philip's good friends, and now you fast forward, and Paul, on this third missionary journey, stops and spends the night in the home of Philip. Isn't that an incredible thing to think about? Just the reconciliation and the forgiveness and everything that must have happened in that situation for us to get to this point. And it says that Philip has, has four daughters that prophesied, and then we see Agabus has this prophecy for Paul where he takes out his belt, as they would often do in the Old Testament prophecies, and they would give him a picture of what is about to happen. And you can read some pretty interesting prophecies where they're illustrated, you know, back in the Old Testament. Now, often when we think of this word prophecy, we think of this idea of foretelling the future, and that's essentially what is taking place here. But the word prophecy can also mean a forth telling, a forth telling of what God wants to do, which is what we're doing right now is the word of God is going out. I am forth telling the word of God. I am prophesying to you, not about the future, but about what God's word says. And sometimes God can use prophecy in our lives to help us determine what his will is. So we see prophecy is important sometimes. Prayer can be important. We see other people can have a part to play in God's will. And then we keep moving on through the passage and we get to verse 13. After Agabus has shared his message, it says, after the people heard Agabus' message, notice what they say in verse 12. When we heard this, we, Luke included, right? We and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. So they have the same response as the people in the last city. When they understand what God is saying about Jerusalem, their advice to Paul is, don't go. Don't go. But then notice what Paul does. Then Paul answered, what are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. For I'm ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, let the, word of the Lord, will of the Lord be done. So another aspect of understanding and deciphering the will of God, I think, comes through our own personal conviction. When you yourself hear that still, small voice of the Spirit prompting your heart to move in a certain direction, you need to follow whatever it is the Spirit of God is leading you to do, no matter how strange and weird it may seem. You see, Paul here expresses some sanctified stubbornness, doesn't he? Despite all the advice he's being given, he's not turning back. He's not going to have it. He's not going to listen because he knows without a doubt what the Spirit of God is leading him to do. And so he illustrates some sanctified stubbornness. Now, I know some of you have this stubbornness thing down. But is it a sanctified stubbornness that says, I'm stubborn when it comes to God's will? I'm not saying stubbornness is always a good thing, but here in Paul's case, it was. Because he was not going to be deterred from what God wanted in his life. So we must learn to give the still, small voice of God's Spirit the authority over all other voices in our life. And that's what we see Paul doing here. Despite what everyone else may be saying, 
Paul says, listen, I know what God wants for me. And I'm willing not only to be imprisoned in Jerusalem, but I'm willing to die there if it comes to that. His personal convictions allowed him to walk in God's will. And when the voice of the Spirit speaks to us, we need to learn to listen. But some of us, the Spirit's voice is almost unrecognizable. We don't recognize it because we've never actually taken time to listen to it or listen for it. And so we need to learn to silence our hearts, to get alone with God, to spend time in his words so we can learn to obey and learn to hear the still small voice of the Spirit. Because there's a lot of voices that compete with that voice. And I use this illustration because I think it's a good one. You have a nursery full of screaming children, right? And anybody can walk by and all they hear are cries of babies. And they're thankful. I'm glad I'm not working in the nursery right now. Right? But you have a mother of one of those childs who is screaming. She can walk by and she can decipher and she can hear that it's her child that is one that's crying, right? Because she's familiar with the voice of her child. And amidst all the other screaming and all the other noise, when somebody else might walk by and have no idea who it is that's speaking, that mom knows because she's familiar with the voice. And in our lives, we need to be so familiar with the voice of the Spirit that we can recognize when it is the Spirit that is speaking to our hearts. And the final thing I'll say about deciphering the will of God is our fifth P here. So we've had people, we've had prayer, we've had prophecy, we've had personal conviction. And the last one I would say is this, principles of God's Word. Because God's Spirit is never going to direct you in opposition to God's Word. And did you know that most of God's will for your life is written down right here in the pages of Scripture? When he says God's will for you is to be thankful, that means that you should be thankful. You don't have to pray about it. You just need to do it. And if you would get the 90% of God's word down that's written here for you, the other 10% will take care of itself. I promise you that. But the problem is we want to go to this book like it's a menu and pick and choose what we do and what we obey Instead of going to God's word, understanding this is our resource, our reference for life, and everything it says needs to be applied to my life, and so therefore we don't truly understand what it means to live in God's will because we're not doing most of what it says. Billy Graham said this, if you are ignorant of God's word, you will always be ignorant of God's will. Isn't that good? If you are ignorant of God's word, you will always be ignorant of God's will. So don't be ignorant of God's word. Allow the word of God to shape your life. And when you obey what the word of God says, you'll be well on your way to figuring out the personal will that God has mapped out for your life. So we need to start by heeding his prescribed will, and then we can focus on his personal will for our lives. Does that make sense? And so the word of God I say for last because that's really the key. All these other things I mentioned, the people and the prophecy and the personal conviction, all those other things can help confirm what God is doing. But if it ever goes against this book, then you can bank on the fact that it is not God's will, period. Because he's never going to go against his word. So we need to have a desire to actually live in God's will. It might be uncomfortable, it might be hard, it might be awkward, but I promise you if you desire after it and truly do it, you will be blessed. We need to learn how to decipher God's will. He uses many different ways sometimes to confirm what his will is in our life. And then this last thing I want you to understand about living this life that is, you know, just in God's will is you need to learn to simply do God's will. So desire it, learn how to decipher it, and then simply do it, right? And that's where it gets really tough. I mean, it's one thing to know, yeah, hey, I know this is what I'm supposed to do, and I'm just going to sit here and not do it, right? This is where the action step comes on your part. Once God's will has clearly been revealed, it's time for us to act. Never can we accomplish something unless we take the steps to do it. I think about the Israelites 
They knew after wandering around in the wilderness that God was finally telling them it's time to go and take the promised land. And he was going to do a lot of miracles along the way. But what did they have to do? They had to have the faith to cross over the Jordan River and actually march into the promised land. They were not going to take it by remaining in the wilderness. They had to march over and they had to conquer the land. And in our lives, we can know God's will without a shadow of a doubt, but if we don't actually step out and do it, then we're never going to experience the joy and the blessing that comes from living in God's will. It will not always be easy, but through God's strength, we can do it, and we can see him work wonders in our lives. And I love what Louis Giglio says about this whole idea. He says, don't overcomplicate God's will. Just stay connected to Jesus, love him, look into his eyes, he will lead, follow, repeat. Don't overcomplicate it. Stay connected to Jesus, love him, look into his eyes, he will lead, follow, repeat. Build your life on that and watch and be amazed at what God will do in your life because he has a personal will for each and every one of you. And amongst all the voices that try to get our attention, what we need to understand is the only voice that matters is God's and the still small voice of his spirit speaking to our hearts. So we need to learn to tune out all the noise, tune into the spirit, and allow God to lead and direct our lives. Understanding it might be uncomfortable at times. In fact, that's probably a good confirmation that you're walking in God's will, is that it's going to be uncomfortable, it's going to be hard, because if you could rely on your own strength, why would you need God to begin with? And so he's going to lead you to do things where you need to depend on him that are going to be uncomfortable, but as you step out in faith and allow God to move and work, you're going to be amazed at what God will do in and through your life. There's a lot of talk about the will of God, right? One of my, the most common questions I get as a pastor, one of the most common questions I got as a youth pastor, teens coming up to me and saying, you know, I want to know what God's will is for my life. Who should I marry? Who should I date? Who should I, you know, I should go to college? All this stuff. We all want to know God's will. It's not complicated. Sometimes it can be hard to decipher. But if you simply tune into Jesus, like Louis Giglio said, stay connected to him, love him, look into his eyes, He'll lead. All you have to do is follow and just build your life on that. And I promise you, the will of God will not be a mystery. Instead, it'll be a masterpiece. It'll be amazing. And you'll get to stand back and watch and see what God does with your life, things you never, ever even dreamed of. Amen? So let's be a church full of individuals that understand and have a desire to live in God's will. Not just talk about it. Yeah, I want to do God's will. But people actually do it and are willing to step into the uncomfortable places to make sure it gets accomplished. So, Father, we thank you for this time and your word. We thank you for the opportunity we have just to gather together. And, Lord, I pray that today as we've looked at just this topic of your will, Lord, that you'll help us to understand, Father, how it is that we can decipher that. Lord, in the culture in which we live, we have so many voices trying to speak into our hearts, trying to tell us what we should do and how we should look and where we should go and all these different things. But Lord, the only voice that really matters is yours. So Lord, help us to learn to tune out the noise so we can walk in tune with your spirit. Lord, thank you for your word that you've given us that, Father, shows us most of which we need to do. And Lord, for those gray areas that aren't revealed in Scripture, thank you for your spirit that will lead us, that will guide us if we'll simply lean in and allow him to do so. So God, may we be people who live out your will and who watch and see you do wonders. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today we're going to end our service in a way we, we try to do once a month. It's actually the first time this year we've done it. In January got crazy with weather and things like that, so we haven't done it yet. So um, we're going to end with communion. And communion is simply a time for us as a